All right, so if you were to look at your keyboard right now, you would see a bunch of alphabet keys and number keys. You would also see modifier keys. So on the Mac, those modifier keys are command and option. On Windows, it would be control and alt, and both of them use the shift key. Now for this video, I've got seven hacks that I wanna show you how you can become even more effective with photo editing using Lightroom desktop and these modifier keys. I'm using this on the Mac, but it'll work the same on Windows, and it should also work in Lightroom Classic, but I haven't used Classic in years, so I can't guarantee it. Before we jump in though, if you're into Lightroom, you wanna learn more about Lightroom and mobile photography uh, and how to lighten up your photo editing workflow, check out my new weekly newsletter. The link's in the description below. It's totally free and it's a lot of fun. All right, let's start. Okay, so here, this is Lightroom desktop. I'm on the Mac. And again, we're gonna be using modifier keys. Whenever I say option, for those of you on Windows machines, you're gonna think of alt. And if I say command, you're gonna think of control. So the first one is actually pretty straightforward. You see these sections over here, there's light, there's color, there's effects. Let's say we go to light over here and you can see that I already made various changes to all of the sliders over here. You could reset an individual slider. If you hover over the slider label, you'll see a, it turns to reset. So if you click on it, it'll bring it back to its zero default state. But if you want to reset all of the sliders in a given section, press and hold on the option or alt key and you'll see that the label goes from light to reset light. If you click on it, you'll see here all of the sliders have reverted back to their default zero state. Now, I don't actually want that, so I'm gonna undo that, but I just wanted to show you that that's a quick first tip. All right, for the second tip, this is actually very important, especially when you're editing the tone of your photo. You can use the option key with five of the sliders under the light section. You can use it with exposure, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. Now, typically I start with the whites and the highlights and then the blacks and the shadows, but it's easiest for me to show you the effect of holding the option key when using the exposure slider. So check it out. I'm gonna press and hold on the option key and then I'm gonna drag on exposure. And as I drag it to the right, you're starting to see a bunch of these kind of colors appear on this mask view. What this is showing me are areas where I am actually blowing out highlights. And these colors actually represent something. So the areas that are white, that's actually indicating that we are blowing out or losing information in all three color channels. And those three color channels are red, green, and blue. Now, if you see red, green, or blue, as is the case here, you can see blue in the sky area. That means that we are blowing out information in that specific color channel. Then if you see cyan, magenta, or yellow, which you see yellow here in the foreground, that means that you are clipping or blowing out information in two out of the three color channels. So this is a great way to get a, a visual idea of the areas where you are losing information, whether it is in the highlights or the shadows. Now I'm gonna go ahead to exposure over here. I'll click on reset. Actually what I'll do is undo twice because that will bring me back to the state it was in. The other thing that you can do is look at the histogram. If you look at the histogram on the top right, you'll see on the left and right corners of the histogram, there are two triangles. The left one indicates whether you are clipping shadows and the right one indicates whether you're blowing out highlights. Because the right triangle is illuminated, that means that we are blowing out highlights in just a small part of our photo. So how do I edit tone? Well, usually the first thing I'll do is I'll press and hold on the option key and I'm gonna start with the white point slider here and I'm gonna bring it to the right. As I do, you can see that we're bringing the white point further and further outside of the available tonal range, which means we are losing information. What I generally do is I bring this uh, white slider until I just see a few dots. A lot of people that I know will actually bring this until they see nothing. And the problem there is you're starting to bring your white point more towards gray and the brightest parts of your image will start to look a little bit muddy. So I recommend it's okay here to just have a few dots. You don't need to worry about that. After I adjust the white point, I go to the highlight slider and the same thing, I press and hold on the option key and I drag right until I start to blow out highlights and then I bring it back. And I basically bring it back until the same thing, until basically I just have a few dots where it's okay that I'm losing some tonal information. And then I repeat the process with the black slider here. So with the black slider, press and hold on the option key. Now in this case here, I have plenty of tonal information. so. What I'm doing is I'm looking at the histogram and I get it until right around here where the black point kind of hits the bottom left 
over here of the histogram. Then I'll go with the shadows, press and hold the option key, see if I start to clip or break any shadows over here, which I don't. So at this point here, I'm gonna let go and I'm gonna look at the image. And I'm actually opening up shadows because if I decrease shadows, the right side of the frame is a bit too dark. So I want a little bit more of the shadow recovery over there. So that's how you can use the Option or Alt key with those tone sliders. For the third tip, let's go to the point curve. Now, I actually have a separate video dedicated to the tone curve. I'll put a card right here. If you wanna learn more about it, and I highly recommend you do, if you're not familiar with how to use the tone curve, or sometimes it's referred to as the point curve, I highly recommend it. This is such a powerful tool. But for this purpose, I'm just gonna show you a quick hack. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna drop a dot right in the middle of my point curve. Now, normally, if I take my mouse or my trackpad and I drag it to the left, you'll see that the point goes all the way to the left. And if I drag my cursor all the way to the right, the point follows and it goes to the right. That's fine if you want to make these kind of big edits, but let's say you kind of get to a place right around here where you're like, okay, this is cool, but I want to refine it. I don't want it to go too far. If I press and hold on the Option or Alt key on the point over here, you'll see that the point is moving a lot more slowly. Even though the cursor is moving left and right, the point itself is giving you basically a lot more granular control and it works up and down as well. So again, if you just click on a point and you move it to the left or the right, it'll move with the cursor. But if you press and hold on the Option key while dragging, you see how the point lags behind the cursor. So it just basically allows you to really fine tune where your point is on your tone curve. Now, again, I showed you that you can reset any one of these sections by pressing and holding on the Option key. So I'm gonna go here and click on Reset Curves and that'll zero out my curves. Now let's move on to Point Color. Point Color is a relatively new tool, at least at the time of this recording. It was released in October, 2023 at Adobe Max. And if you click on the dropper, you can select on a color in the image, which will allow you to adjust the hue, saturation, and luminance. I have a separate video on point color, so you definitely should check that out as well. And here's the thing. If you look at the two boxes over here, or they're kind of rectangles, you've got this wide rectangle over here. This controls the hue and the saturation shift. This narrow rectangle controls luminance. Luminance is easy. Luminance just goes up and down. However, if you wanna adjust the hue or the saturation using the dot over here, taking the dot and dragging it to the left and to the right will adjust the hue and going up and down will adjust saturation. The problem is that it's kind of difficult to get the hue going on a straight line without going a little bit up or a little bit down. So fortunately, there is a way to lock that in. If you only want to adjust the hue, let's say you are happy with the saturation of this value, but you only want to adjust the hue. If you press and hold on the command or control key, you see this horizontal line appear. Now I can move this dot left and right, and it will never go up and down, even though I'm still clicking on it. If you want to reverse that and only adjust the saturation, again, that goes up and down, but you don't want to adjust the hue, which goes left and right, press and hold on the shift key. Now you'll see there is this vertical line. I can take this dot and go up and down, but if I go left and right, it does not go anywhere. So it's just an easier way for you to fine tune exactly the hue and saturation values that you want to adjust for this color swatch. Again, let's press and hold on the option key and click on reset point color to reset this section. For the fifth tip, we're gonna to go to color grading. So color grading replaced the split toning panel in Lightroom Classic from like years ago. And I love it because it allows you to add a specific hue to the highlights, midtones, and shadow areas of your photo. And I've got a video on color grading as well, so be sure to check that out. Now here's how I use color grading. It's pretty straightforward. What I'll do is, let's say I start with the shadows. I'm gonna click on this dot here and I'm gonna drag out. And what this does is it shows me whatever that hue is, it shows me what it looks like at 100% saturation. So what I'll do is I'm gonna rotate this around the color wheel until I find a hue that looks good. For shadows, I like to go more towards the cooler hue, so around this blue here. Problem is that I want to adjust the saturation because I don't want it at 100%, I want it to be more subtle. Thing is, if I drag in here, you can see how I'm, it's similar to the point color tool where I just want the saturation, which is in and out, 
I don't want to adjust the hue, which is kind of going around the circle here. So if I want to lock in the hue, but only adjust saturation, I can press and hold on the shift key. You can see here, this hard line appears. Now, if I go left and right with my cursor, the hue doesn't change. And so I can just go in and out and adjust the saturation. And so here I can just add a little bit of a cooler hue to the shadow region of the photo. And I can do the same thing here with highlights. I can take this dot, bring it out here, find a nice kind of warmer tone for the highlight over there, press and hold on the shift key, bring it to zero for saturation, and then slowly introduce that color grade for the highlights. Let's go ahead and reset this by pressing on the option key and then clicking on the section title over here. All right, next for our sixth tip, we're gonna go to vignettes. Now I love vignettes because it helps draw the viewer's eye more towards the center of the frame and does that by either darkening or brightening the edges. So if I take the amount slider here, actually a lot of times you might not even realize this, but you might have your disclosure triangle hiding those additional tools for a vignette. So I recommend clicking on this and you'll see these additional sliders for the vignette tool. Again though, bring the amount slider to the left will darken the edges and bringing it to the right will brighten them. So let's say you kind of want your amount for the vignette to be right around here, but you then want to refine the midpoint, the roundness and the feather. Midpoint controls just how far towards the center the vignette will be applied. Roundness will apply the shape to the vignette, whether you want it to be more round or more square. And then there's the feather, which controls the transition from the hard edge to the soft edge. Now it can be hard to visualize the midpoint, for example, this is where the option key comes in. If you press and hold the option key while dragging on midpoint, what happens is the vignette turns to a negative 100%. It's as if you took this amount slider and brought it to negative 100. It just makes it easier to see. So even though we're at negative 32, if I press and hold on the option key and drag midpoint over here, you'll see here, it's a lot easier to visualize where the midpoint is. So let's say I kind of want it more towards the center. When I let go, the vignette is reverted back to the actual strength that you have. Same thing goes for roundness. So if I press and hold on the option key while dragging on roundness, you'll see how the vignette shape becomes more of a circle. If I bring it to the left here, it becomes almost like a rectangle, kind of brings you out to the edges here, like an old time still frame. So here, I actually like my vignettes to be more round and we're looking good. Then finally, the feather controls the transition. If you press and hold on the option key while dragging to the left, you're gonna see a very hard edge. So there's almost no transition from the dark to the bright. If I bring it to the right though, we get this beautiful soft transition. So that looks great. And sometimes when I have my midpoint, my roundness and my feather dialed in, I might go back to the amount, maybe it's too dark, so I'm gonna ease off on that. But basically that's how I use the modifier keys to really refine the look of the vignette. And finally, we've got sharpening. Now sharpening is typically one of the last things you're gonna do when you edit your photo, when you're done with everything else. And I highly recommend when you apply sharpening, First thing is make sure that you have similar to vignette that you have this disclosure triangle expanded. So you see the three other controls for sharpening. The other thing that I recommend doing is zooming in so that you are at 100% or a one-to-one -one view on an area of the photo that you know you have in focus and that should be sharp with detail. Now, one of the things about sharpening, it's not actually sharpening the photo. Like, it's not gonna restore missed focus information. You shouldn't use it like that. It's almost like an illusion. What, what sharpening is doing is it's actually adding detail through contrast. It's adding high contrast edge detail. So everywhere that you have hard edges in your photo, by Lightroom adding contrast to that, it gives the illusion or the impression of sharpness, but it's not actually sharpening. So. I just wanted to get that out of the way. Let me show you how I use the modifier keys with these tools though. So the reason why I told you to zoom in is because this is the best way to see sharpening in action. And just like before, I'm gonna press and hold on the option key. While dragging on the sharpening amount slider, you see how the image turns grayscale. The reason for that is it's actually easier to see the sharpening effect when you remove color and you're just focusing on tone. And so 
as I bring this amount slider over, you see like, especially in the grass, uh, kind of behind the, the rock, how it's over sharp and it looks over crispy. Also in the background there, it just looks way too sharp. This is called over sharpening and you want to avoid it. What I recommend doing is bringing it to zero and then kind of going like this. Like I almost go left and right and I do it much more slowly than this, but I'm basically looking for details to pop without it actually starting to get overly crispy. So right around here looks good. Now, this is important because I'm not saying that every photo should have 50 for the amount. This will change depending on the contents of your photo. Some photos might need far less sharpening, some might need a little bit more, but don't take these values as gospel that this is what you should do for every photo. I just wanna show you how I use it. So now that we have the amount dialed in, you see there are three additional sliders. There's radius, detail, and masking. The way radius works is it controls kind of the thickness of the edge where that contrast was applied that I was just telling you about. So if you have a lower value, it's gonna give you a thinner edge where the detail is added. And then if you add a larger value to the slider, it's gonna give you a thicker edge. And I'll show you what that looks like. Then with detail, the detail slider basically controls the amount of sharpening that's applied to the details in your photo. So if you have a low value for that slider, then basically it's only going to sharpen larger edges. And if you have a higher value, it's gonna sharpen even smaller edges. So it's gonna give you a lot more detail. Again, press and hold on the option key. That's how I use it. And you'll see that the image takes on this kind of mask view. If I bring the radius slider to the left, you'll see here basically the thickness of the edge where we're applying that contrast. It's, it's very, very thin. So you almost don't see that outline anymore. If we take the radius slider all the way to the right though, you see how it becomes a lot thicker. I don't recommend this. Basically what I recommend doing is bring this radius slider until you kind of get a rough outline. Here, this is almost invisible. It looks very mushy. But when we bring it to right around there, that looks good. We're starting to get nice crisp edges, nice defined edges. So I'm gonna let go there and I'm gonna do the same thing with detail. If I bring the detail slider to the left while holding on the option or alt key, you'll see that the lar only the largest edges, only the largest lines in the photo are getting detail applied. But if I bring it to the right here, every small little edge in the photo has sharpening or detail applied. And that can also result in over sharpening. So what I recommend is similar to the radius slider, until you get a nice clean outline of the image, that's when you'll wanna let go. And if you click on the little eye icon over here, you can see it actually does a really nice job. If I toggle, everything looks a little bit softer here, but with sharpening, it adds just the right amount of detail. Now there is one final slider that's super important and that is masking. Typically masking will be set to zero. And when you're working with masking, I recommend zooming out to fit so you see the whole image. Masking controls where the sharpening is applied and where it should be removed. Now. Generally areas that are soft, like the sky, doesn't have much detail to it. Even things like the little waterfall over here and this little body of water don't need sharpening applied to it. So the way that I use masking is I press and hold in the option key, just like the other three sliders, and I start dragging. And you can see here, we're getting a proper mask view. As I drag the slider to the right, more and more of the sharpening is being removed from the photo. How do you know where sharpening is applied? It's pretty straightforward. Anywhere that's black means that sharpening is being removed and anywhere that's white or kind of gray, that has sharpening applied. The way that I use this masking slider is I adjust it until I get almost like a pencil sketch of the image. So right around here, this is a good pencil sketch of the photo. Notice how the waterfall has been masked out and notice how everything but the edges of the clouds in the sky have been masked out. We don't want sharpening applied there. So when I let go, I can now be confident that I'm having sharpening applied only where it should be applied, which is the edges of the area in the photo. See, I told you just a few of these modifier keys, they're really powerful. They can fundamentally change how you interact with editing your photos using Lightroom. It just gives you a different and sometimes better way to visualize the changes that you're making. Now, like I said in the beginning of this video, if you want to learn more about Lightroom and mobile photography, I invite you to sign up to my free weekly newsletter. That link is in the description below. 
I've also got this playlist here, which has a bunch of Lightroom desktop and mobile tutorial videos if you wanna keep your learning journey going. If you like this video, as always, a thumbs up is appreciated. Be sure to subscribe and click on that bell icon to be notified for all future videos. Thanks a lot, everyone.